We're good? Okay. Um, all right, <laughs> good morning, everyone. So thanks to those of you that are here in person, we have quite a large crowd on Zoom. So welcome to everybody on Zoom. Thanks for attending the talk today. Um, before we begin, I just remind everyone that we have many events scheduled throughout the fall. We'll be adding more soon. So you can check out um, our website for those. And we also have a wool spinning demonstration happening here in this exact space tomorrow afternoon at one. So it should be kind of fun. It's gonna be rainy, but it's gonna be inside. So. Um, but moving back to today, um, I'm so happy to introduce our speaker, Bev Wolof. Um, Bev has an MA in the History of Decorative Arts from the Smithsonian Corcoran College of Art and Design. Her background's in fashion history, specializing in lace and material culture. Wolof photographs and identifies lace for museums and has worked extensively with the Smithsonian National Museum of American History and Mount Vernon, among others. Her talk today is titled, Did George Washington Wear Lace? Lace and Colonial America. Right. And I'll turn it over to Bev. Oh, this Oh, and I don't know why I lost my lost your signal. Do you need to bring it back on? Oh, there you go. No, nope. yeah, I think it, it just fell asleep. <laughs> there you go. I understand about going to sleep. Okay. Does this work? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. I probably should have titled this talk, Colonial Lace in America, and Did, you, did George Washington Wear Any? <laughs> um, in the process of preparing, I realized I needed to change the sequence of my stories. I promise we'll get to George, but it's not where we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start with a basic. What is American colonial lace anyway? It is lace that was worn in this country between 1600 and 1800. It was those 200 years when America was a collection of colonies eventually formalizing into states. I emphasize the word worn versus made because with the exception of lace made in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and we'll come back to that, and a small sample of hobbyists, all colonial lace was imported. There was no American lace per se during this time period. American colonial lace was a collection of European laces as diverse as the countries who made it. What made it ours, American, is who wore it in this country during this time period. I am using the question, did George Washington wear lace as our touch point? The answer will come in layers, because this is a story not just about George Washington. It's about how lace, a European luxury good, became embedded in American material culture. So what is, let's see if this works. What is material culture? Material culture is those physical objects that represent a culture, or an even a personal identification. It relies on broad personal, broad social acceptance of what that object signifies. It's a matter of association. Wearing it, using it, simply owning it, identifies those who subscribe to that culture, that life philosophy, that mindset. For example, political pins, wearing a religious symbol, a cowboy hat, blue jeans. And while lace would seem an unlikely candidate for American material culture, it became just that. Lace was the thread, literally, that tied together the American colonial North and South. How did this happen? Why? What made it so? Who made it so? To get these answers, we're going to travel down a series of paths. I hope by the time I've finished this presentation, we've had some fun and I've given you a few things to think about. It's hard to imagine something as delicate as lace in early America because life in those early years was raw. It was about survival. There was disease, cruel weather, failed crops, and particularly in the Chesapeake region, fighting with Native Americans. 
whether you had a roof over your head, food to eat, clothing to keep you warm, you had to depend on the assistance and cooperation of your neighbors. Who had an ax to fell trees? Who was successful in growing vegetables or raising livestock? Who planted flax or cotton so that thread could be spun or raised sheep for wool? Who could spin thread? Who had a loom to make cloth? Who was skilled in hunting animals for food and fur to keep you warm so you could survive another winter? Who was skilled, excuse me, who had knowledge of healing and birthing? How did anyone get through another year, another season, another day? You had to depend on the assistance and cooperation of those around you. And in exchange, you also gave, be it a skill or a material good. Everyone was of equal standing but gradually that began to change. Okay. By the 1630s, 30s, enterprises such as tobacco growing, the fur trade, the export of wood badly needed for building ships for the British Navy, and shipping in general became reasonably reliable money, money, excuse me, Money makers, I did get it right. The growing colonial economy stabilized American lifestyle and encouraged more immigrants. So who was coming to America? Allow me to introduce you to our cast of characters. There were multiple nationalities immigrating to America. French, Dutch, German, Spanish to name a few, but the English dominated the numbers because of merchant sponsorships and clever advertising. Even as England was undergoing significant economic growth, there was widespread poverty and general misery in England. In addition, to, in addition, a nasty war raged between Catholics and Protestants with political as well as religious ramifications. Many were inspired to try their luck in the new world. In these early years, there were three hubs for American colonial settlement, New England in the north, the Chesapeake region in the south, and the Delaware Valley, think Philadelphia, in the middle. We're only going to deal with New England and the Chesapeake region for this story because the Delaware, Delaware Valley wasn't, didn't become a significant player until the late 1600s, and that's when William Penn stepped in and started Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. There were stark uh, profile differences between those who immigrated to New England versus those who immigrated to the Chesapeake. Immigrants attracted to New England tended to be in their 30s or 40s, came with their families, and often a servant or two. They had been screened by merchant companies who sponsored them to exclude the to, to excuse me to exclude the disruptive or obstinate, but to include craftsmen, physicians, midwives, ministers, and other useful people. While there were plenty of Puritans who came to New England and religious colonization was an important factor, pilgrims and Puritans were a distinct minority. Most who came to New England were actively recruited by, promote, by promoters who promised them they would have a better life in America. Regardless of motive, New England settlers came to stay, make a new life. Those who immigrated to the Chesapeake region, and we're now talking Virginia and the Carolinas, uh, these were not cavaliers, as some would have you believe, nor were they the younger sons of gentry. Immigrants to Virginia were almost entirely male, young, single, ambitious, not particularly educated, and competitive. They were lured to America by the hope of quick wealth by unscrupulous London agents who painted Virginia as the land of milk and honey. Few planned to make a life in America. It was stay five years, make your fortune, 
and returned to England. It was a temporary transient life. It wasn't just the matrix of the population that was so different between New England and the Chesapeake region. The organization of the communities was also very different. New? Come on. There we go. <clears throat> Highly dependent on the shipping industry, New England settlements tended to hug the coast. They organized as villages as a way to stay in close proximity to neighbors. They may need to trade or for assistance. Their economy was primarily merchant-based. Those who settled in the Chesapeake region had no interest in establishing villages or concentrated communities. Land was meant to grow profitable tobacco. So Virginia became a conglomerate of plantations loosely organized in counties. It meant that Chesapeake region family units were spread out, somewhat isolated, and necessarily self-supporting. What New England and the Chesapeake region had in common was the wish to maintain English culture. This included establishing old world social hierarchy. Why was this important? Where one stood on the social ladder could affect influence, even power within the community. Back in England, social hierarchy was generally granted through royal titles, but there were no titles in America. In America, social position was up for grabs. The catch? Recognition of social supremacy had to be granted by one's associates. And so regardless of geographic locale, social interaction was of supreme importance to settlers in the new world. In New England, the close proximity of neighbors sped the establishment of social hierarchy. Social opportunities included church attendance, teas, dances, lectures, even everyday activities such as casual visiting and going to market. In the Chesapeake region, geographic distance meant socializing required more effort. Planned events such as weddings or an occasional fete planned by the church. It might also mean traveling to a governing hub such as Williamsburg to see and be seen. That all worked, but how was anyone to know in either community who had precious social supremacy? How were the upwardly mobile identified within their community? One identifier, money. How do you let others know you have money? You spend it. No point in having fancy carriages if there aren't roads. Big house, many would have to come and see it. Nice furniture, same problem as the house. You could do what was done in Europe. You could wear your money. And here is where lace takes on importance in American material culture. It's expensive. It's a luxury good. Only some could afford it. Wearing lace was power dressing. Where was the American money coming from to buy European lace? The same industries that were making money for European investors was also making money for savvy immigrants. In the real world of colonial settlers, how did lace as power dressing work? First of all, whether, whether lace was worn at all depended not only on personal wealth, but the attitude and rules of the community. Certain religious groups, such as the Pilgrims and Puritans in Massachusetts, advocated extreme simplicity in dress and lace was forbidden. Sumptuary laws, not often actually applied. Why? Because the sumptuary laws were supposed to be enforced, enforced by the clergy, but the wives of the clergymen also wanted to wear lace. So they discouraged their husbands from enforcing any of the sumptuary laws. Climate was also a factor. In the colder regions of New England, the preference was for warmer fabrics and fur 
rather than lightweight lace, at least in the winter. And individuals who own lace did not wear it every day. Rather, it was saved for special occasions. Keep in mind, wealth in America didn't automatically signal who had position and power. Wealth in America signaled who had gained or might be gaining power. So how do we know who was wearing lace? Lace ownership might show up in inventory lists of estate settlements. There are letters to merchants requesting the purchase of lace. There are bills of sale and personal corresponding correspondence mentioning lace procured or worn. But one of the most obvious tells was portraits. I know a lot of you know this picture. <clears throat> Painted between 1671 and 74. And the reason there's a, an age gap is because it was, she was originally painted with a fan in her hand. And then later they took the fan out and added baby Mary. So there's a gap there in when this painting was actually done. This is Elizabeth Freak and baby Mary. Most of you will be familiar with this portrait. It is regarded as the finest American painting of the 17th century. The painter is simply known as the freak limner, and a limner is a person who was painting but wasn't formally trained. And you can see the lack of dimension here, but I love this painting. We're going to come back to these two. I'm showing them first just to give you an orientation because the person we're going to discuss first is Elizabeth's husband, John. John Freak was born in England in 1631, the third son of Thomas and Mary Doddington Freak. He immigrated to Boston in 1658, as younger sons do. He is listed in contemporary documents as a merchant and attorney and served the town as constable and juryman. In 1661, he married Elizabeth Clark, daughter of a merchant, who bore him eight children. The magazine Antiques had a wonderful article about the Freak family published in 2021. In it, author Henry Adams describes John Freak as, quote, an early, American, an early specimen of a successful capitalist entrepreneur, end quote. At the time of his untimely death, death from a gunpowder explosion on one of his ships, John Freak was a prosperous man. He owned both an old and new dwelling house, a brew house, land at Fort Hill, and was partial owner of six ships. At a time when many people did not own chairs at all, but simply sat on the floor or on benches, the Freaks owned 14 chairs with fancy turkey work coverings, one of which is evidently in the portrait of his wife. Now, I want you to take a look at the bib collar that John Freak is wearing. It is Italian needle lace, appreciated for its bold three-dimensional appearance. It is time consuming to make. It was very expensive. I know you can't see details from the painting, but I want you to show you what Italian needle lace looks like up close. And I'm going to tell you now that all the photographs you see are ones that I have taken, okay? So this is from the Smithsonian. And uh, take a look at the raised surfaces, the meticulous needlework, and the engaging design. Give you a moment with that. Okay, now we're back to Elizabeth. <clears throat> um, the lace Kate Elizabeth wears also suggests needle lace, although the overall design is on a smaller, more feminine scale. And this is what her lace might look like. That's also from the Smithsonian. Um, and the soft drape of Elizabeth's sleeve ruffles, uh, the trim on baby Mary's cap, and possibly the flounce on Elizabeth's skirt might have been bobbin lace. Now keep in mind, needle lace and bobbin lace were being made at the same time. So that's a close up of baby Mary. Come on. Don't do this to me. Here we go. Um, this is a piece of Flemish bobbin lace. 
Uh, I love how dense the pattern is. And I'll show you some details, maybe. No, it's giving me a hard time there. Did that wrong, oh, sorry. That is a detail of that bobbin lace. You are seeing it from the front. And one of the things I like to do as a photographer and as someone who is making records of lace in collections is I also like to photograph from the back because I like to look at construction. And that's what that same piece looks like from the back. Okay. The freaks were extremely prosperous as well as upwardly mobile. Henry Adams states, quote, they were interested in luxury and in obtaining the best goods and workmanship available in 17th century Boston. I would add, why not? Lace was the equivalent of jewelry. No one of financial substance or social position would be painted without it. It came in many forms. And even though men continued to wear lace through the 1700s, it gradually became mostly the purview of the ladies, which is where we're going to focus. And I'm gonna show you a series of slides of women wearing lace in the 1700s. And I would point out to you um, and some different artists, and I have made a point to tell you where these portraits are because I would encourage you to go see them in person. There is no substitute for standing in front of a painting. You see details you just cannot see, you know, in a book or on a slide. But she is wearing a double collar. I mean, just to make sure you understand she can afford lace. She has a collar on her shoulders and a collar going up her neck. And she is wearing a very elaborate lace piece excuse me, going around the neckline of her, of her bodice. And then she has a very elaborate lace ruffle that's called an engagement. That is the lace ruffle that comes out from the bottom of a sleeve. I'll talk about engagements more than once. Um, but she is wealthy and everyone wanted to, uh, her husband amongst everyone else, wanted everyone to know that he had money. She was his advertisement, so to speak. So this is probably done by her husband. Um, notice that she has a couple of different husbands. Um, death happened, you know, illness, accident, war, whatever. But she's also wearing lace. Now, her lace around her neckline is a little bit on her skin and a little bit outside on top of the fabric. It's how she chose to wear it. Lace like that was made with a, a lace finish, not a sewing edge, but with a double finish. So she has scallops at the top of it, scallops at the bottom of it, and she's gonna show that off. And it's not possible to actually say, I'm guessing she has lace on her cap since that's somewhat painted in. And then of course she has the lace engagement. Okay. Here again, you're seeing lace that it's a different style of neckline, a lace again around uh, the neckline of the dress. Keep, uh, as I said, lace was the equivalent of jewelry. So instead of having something at the neck, they put something on the neckline in order to soften the look and to be feminine and to be beautiful. It was all part of that picture. And she uh, shows off that she has two engagements, just to make sure you know she's got money, or her husband does. And I love this lady. I, she's just got a look on her face like, are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, and she's the first of drawings, that uh, paintings I'm showing you by John Singleton Copley. I'm gonna show you a few. Um, this is at the Met. And she is wearing her lace differently more modestly for a slightly older woman. She's not, you know, so she has something called a fichu. It's sort of like a, a mini shawl and she brings it around and tucks it in. So she's a little more covered on the bosom. 
Um, but again, she has that double uh, engagement and I love her. She's got such attitude. <laughs> you also would have worn lace on gowns and aprons and skirts. Um, one way I, I want to describe this to you, um, and I'm not showing you a picture because it's just as easy to describe. I'm sure you have seen um, dresses where there's a full skirt and then there's a fancy something with sleeves and then there's this thing in the front. Okay. It's a three piece ensemble. You put on the skirt. It has a waistband that has a tie running through it. It's tied in the back. It goes over your petticoats, one piece. Then you put on what's called the robe. And you literally put your sleeve in, your arm in one sleeve, arm in the other sleeve, and you put it on. And what it does is it's open in the front. And so it drapes over your skirt on either side. In the meantime, your bosom is a little exposed. What covers that? Something called a stomacher. And that would be a sort of V-shaped piece, usually heavily embroidered and your robe was pinned to either side of it, and that's what covered you up. That was the three pieces. I promise you there were no zippers going up the back. <laughs> but one of the ways lace could be used was to decorate the edge of the robe. And sometimes the lace would face out, sometimes the lace would face in, sometimes the lace would go from the shoulder down to the, to the waist, down to the uh, hem, Sometimes it would just go from the waist down to the hem. There were a lot of variations on this. We're going to be talking about trim in just a moment, but those were different ways that you could wear lace. For quite some time, I also, I have made the statement, how lace was worn depended on the prevailing fashions and trend, fashion trends of Europe. In preparation for this talk, I gave that statement a rethink. I've decided that's a reasonable assessment in the 1600s, but less so for the 1700s. By the 1700s, America was, a re was increasingly becoming its own self. Furniture, excuse me, furniture might borrow a design from England, but was made of American wood. House design adapted to the American landscape and used materials at hand. And while there was communication of latest European fashions, there was American variation in material and certain details. So it seems it was with lace. It does not mean that there was no opulent lace coming into America at this time, and I'll show you some. But from roughly 1760 onward, the majority of the lace we see in portraits is trim, rather than a dedicated shape that had limited function. These long stretches of edging could be used in multiple ways, even transferred from one article of clothing to another. <clears throat> Excuse me. A border along a neckline or robe could become an engagement or trim a cap in a second use. Flexible, universal trim. It may have been somewhat less opulent, less elite, but it was definitely a more practical investment. So, and I know many of you know this picture also. Also one of my favorites. This is Mercy Otis, also known as Mrs. James Warren. Uh, this was also painted by Copley in 1763. This is another woman with attitude. She had good reason. She was a writer, a poet, um, and somewhat a person of controversy. Um, here we see the engagement as a more economical muslin ruffle, a, a muslin piece. And then the trim was just attached around the outside edge. And I have to tell you, as someone who had spent so much time um, learning about lace, European lace, that when I stood in front of this, it was the first time I realized that not everyone in America was wearing an engagement that was complete lace. Um, I, I saw the muslin, I saw the trim, and I went, well, for heaven's sakes. Um, 
It is most likely fine Mechlin lace, the flesh and bobbin, bobbin lace that John Copley, John Singleton Copley included in his portraits uh, of colonial women. And I'm gonna show you some uh, close-ups of that. This is the back of a cap. This is Mechlin lace, again, very dense pattern. And um, some of you may be aware, others not. When we are trying to identify, looking at a piece of lace and we're going, what kind of lace is that? You're looking for a variety of different features. And one of them is how is the ground made? Now, one kind of ground is bars, brides, bridges. That's simple line. We're not going there. But with bobbin lace and sometimes needle lace, and eventually with needle lace, I should say, you have net and how the net was made, how that net, how that ground, what that was made of net was made, identified to a large extent, what kind of lace we're looking at. And so that's a diagram of what Mechlin net looks like. And that's what it looks like worked. So you can see what that is. Um, I'm very fond of this piece. Um, it may be my imagination. I am identifying this as a baby collar. This is the way I photographed it at the Smithsonian. And what you should be looking at is that there are actually two pieces of lace there. The inner border is an inch wide. The outer border is two inches. So together, obviously, it's three inches. My imagination is that if you can visualize a Jane Austen dress, very simple, you know, the waistline is underneath the bosom, you've got a little puff sleeve, okay? For a short sleeve like that, someone wanted to put lace on it, it would only be about an inch of lace. If the sleeve was longer, proportionally, you needed more lace. So a longer sleeve would have two inches of lace. Someone didn't want to throw out their lace. And so they put the two pieces together to make a collar to be used later. It might not have been so in fashion for a woman, but when I measured the inside um, perimeter of that, it was about 13 inches, which is traditionally about the width of a baby neck. So I decided to call this a baby collar made out of two antique pieces of Mechlin lace. Okay. Oh, and that's, uh, sorry, that's a close-up of what the Mechlin lace would look like worked. Okay. I'm having fun with John Singleton Copley. He used this blue dress a lot. You know, there's, there's always the possibility, the rumor, if you will, that someone painted the dress and he came along and painted the head and just added in there. But there was a certain amount of that with painters that you borrowed things. We're gonna come back to this in a different way in order to make a painting look spectacular. The one thing he did do is both of these ladies have the same lace as their engagement. If I went back to um, Mercy Otis Warren, you will see her lace is a little different for whatever reason. She probably knowing Mercy, she probably insisted on having her own lace. How was this bounty of Flemish lace arriving on our shores? Flanders used France to ship its lace, but a certain amount wasn't supposed to arrive here. A quantity of Flemish lace was intended for the Spanish colonies in South America, Peru, and Chile, but frequently failed to reach their scheduled destination. You could blame storms at sea and pirates but there were also unscrupulous uh, ship captains who made unscheduled ports of call down the American East Coast because it was closer than South America and a faster turnaround for profit. So was trim added to muslin just a portrait device by one painter who wanted to limit time painting lace? I don't believe so. I think it was an American trend because the preference for lace in trim format wasn't just in New England. It was also in the Chesapeake. And I think I've deprived you of one picture. 
Hold on. This is another one. I love this lady. Um, but you can see how rich her lace is around her. That's that, that black is that fichu that I was talking about. She was covering herself in a different way. Again, with a double engagement. Um, I did some research on her once upon a time. Her husband, and look at the satin and uh, the brocade chair she's sitting in. Let's not leave out any details here. And her husband shipped fruit, amongst other things. And she's letting you know that he's painting for the, he's paying for the painting. She may as well advertise for him. Okay. This is Martha Dandridge Custis Washington. She was born June 2nd, 1731 at Chestnut Grove Plantation in New Kent County, Virginia. Eldest of eight children born to John Dandridge, da John Dandridge, sorry, the son of an English merchant and Francis Jones, whose father was a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. Her education, quote, was tip, probably typical for a girl of her class at that time and would have stressed housekeeping, religion, reading, writing, music, and dancing skills, which would be useful in her expected role as the wife of a, of a Virginia plantation owner. In her late teens, Martha caught the eye of Daniel Park Custis, 20 years her senior. His father, John Custis IV, was initially against the marriage because Martha's family wasn't as wealthy as he would have liked. But he was charmed by Martha once he met her and happily gave consent. Daniel's sudden death in 1757 left Martha at the age of 26 a very wealthy widow with a 17,500 acre plantation to manage and 300 enslaved people. Less than a year later, she was being courted by several men, including a certain militia officer. She and George Washington married January 6, 1759, and moved to Washington's home, Mount Vernon, in early April of that year. And I will take a moment to pause. And my understanding is Bidwell House, where I'm speaking, was built in the 1760s. Am I correct about that? This house was being built while George and Martha were enjoying their honeymoon years at Mount Vernon, if that gives you some perspective. In the early years of their marriage, Martha was a happy helpmate <clears throat> running the Mount Vernon plantation. As well as housekeeping and home management, she undoubtedly had many occasions to dress her best for guests. Lace would have been an absolute element of her wardrobe. This is a pair of, I'm gonna show you a close up in a moment. This is a pair of cuffs worn uh, by her. And I wanna point out, this is an English lace. This is in 1759. We still had reasonable relationship with England at the time. This is a little more of a close up so you can see that. Um, this is Brussels lace. This gets back into, it's also from Flanders, different from Mechlin. You can see the straight sewing edge and one edge that's more developed. This is such a long piece that it could have been used to trim her robe if she had chose. She was a little woman. I mean, she was barely five feet, maybe a hair over five feet. So she was tiny. So this could have gone from her shoulder to her waist down to the bottom, or she just had a long piece of trim and she would cut it up as she went, wanted to, to trim anything she chose. Um, I did not mention when I was talking early about lappets. A lappet was a streamer. You could attach it to the side of a cap. Um, it's something that came out of the church. Normally it would have been to the back of somebody in the church. Women at this time were wearing it attached to the front of a cap because if you wore your hair pulled back and then you put a cap on top of it, you might want something like a lappet to soften the look around your face. 
And Lapids went, like anything, went through a variety of different stages. This one has a very sweet curve at the bottom, but sometimes they were pointy. Sometimes they were somewhat pointy, but rounded at the end. Sometimes they were flat at the bottom. They were longer, they were shorter. They went through a bunch of different styles, but this is one that Martha had. Okay, this is another piece. I wanted to show you that she did have Mechelen lace. And I'm gonna show, I, I made a point to note this was somewhat in the 1740s, 1750s. I'll explain why I dated it that way, because this is also Mechelen lace. And what I want you to look at is the ratio of ground, that open area that has no design versus the amount of uh, pattern that's actually there. And in the top piece, it's roughly, don't call me a liar, it's roughly 75% pattern and about 25% ground. And that's what was in style at that time. As we moved forward later into the 1700s, the choice between style of clothing, the patterns of fabric, all those sorts of things, the ratio started to move a little bit. And so 20, you know, 10, 20 years later, it's a little more of a 50-50 of ground versus pattern. When you get to the end of the century, I didn't bother to bring one in because you're going to see it a little differently soon, it becomes. 25% pattern roughly and 75% ground. Everything had really gotten very light, but I wanted to show you that's one of the ways I date things. Anybody dates things. Okay. Okay. Martha traveled to be with her husband and his troops primarily during the quiet no fighting winter seasons during the Revolutionary War. She and other ladies resided in nearby towns during these intervals, providing everything from simple social occasions to basic survival necessities, as in going to farms and saying, we have soldiers that are over in Valley Forge and they need to be fed. Would you please donate food? It was on that basic level. And always critical for troop morale, including these little get togethers that they would do. The best guess is that the lace was left behind in Mount Vernon. It would have been impractical and inappropriate in war's Spartan life. Uh, plain muslin would have been more appropriate, but um, I don't have a firm answer for that for you yet. This is my ongoing research. But at war's end, the need for lace would have suddenly increased. George Washington was now a figure of international renown. Having Returned to Mount Vernon life, the Washingtons found themselves hosting not just family and friends, but hundreds of guests each year from all over the country and the world. In 1789, George Washington became president, and Martha was thrust into the role of first lady. She was not happy about this unexpected job, but she gamely took it on. Formal get togethers. I'm actually going to go back a picture because. Unless you're happy staring at this. You're happy staring at this. Okay. Formal get togethers, levies as they were called, were soon established to give many the opportunity to socialize with the president. George Washington wanted to give his constituents the opportunity to chat with him, but he also needed to control access so he could get work done. You did not need an invitation nor an appointment. The only requirement is that the person attending was dressed respectably. George Washington himself would generally wear brown or black velvet, a cloth he felt gave dignity to the office and gravitas to the occasion. And a lot of people think a velvet is this heavy stuff that we tend to see around Christmas time. Velvet is actually a weave. It's not a cloth per se. So you can make velvet out of a variety of different kinds of threads. There's such a thing as cotton velvet, wool velvet, ever different kinds of, so he could vary the weight of the velvet in order to match the season, and he would still look very formal. Martha 
when she joined him, would have needed to look the part. Refined, respectable, she needed lace. Post-Revolutionary War, there was still reluctance to take advantage of British imports, and the French were embroiled in their own difficulties. Martha certainly had her lace collection of the past to pull from, but she also had an alter alternative resource. There were many lace makers immigrated to the American colonies, but only Ipswich, Massachusetts developed lace making into a money-making industry. In the early 1700s, Ipswich was a busy seaport. It hosted a thriving fishing enterprise and was key in transporting inland farm goods along the East Coast. However, in the early 1740s, shifting sands at the mouth of the Ipswich River gradually prevented passage of large ships, critical for moving cargo in and out of Ipswich. By 1750, the town was in serious economic decline. The Revolutionary War further exacerbated the problem as men went to battle. The town's financial resources all but vanished. Women in the community sought a way to provide or at least supplement family income. All colonial communities included people who spun thread, wove cloth, sewed. They were, these were necessary crafts for survival but Ipswich was unusual. The U.S. Census of 1790 counted 600 lace makers among 602 Ipswich households. Ipswich residents had long mitigated their financial problems by making and selling lace, a popular fashion industry. And what you're looking at is a pillow for making bobbin lace, which Ipswich is. Um, you could, the white strip, oh, wait, wait. oops, I shouldn't do that. The, that strip is a uh, pricking that has the pattern. That's a piece of lace that was made from the pricking to the side of it. Over on the far right is another pricking that is oiled paper that could be used. If you're familiar with bobbin lace making, you know you're putting pins into a pattern to hold threads as you change direction. And that is a series of bobbins. I think they're bamboo. And to get back to your question about Karen, Karen asked me to photograph this for her. She's used this slide many times in her presentations. And she's always very gracious about saying that I was the one that photographed it. The Reverend Joseph Dana of Ipswich collected samples of his town's lace between 1789, 1790, preparing a report to the new Massachusetts Senator, George Cabot. Cabot forwarded the package to Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Tench Cox. Cox, enthusiastic for American manufacturing, presented the lace to Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, along with Reverend, Reverend Dana's request that once inspected, the lace should be presented to George and Martha Washington. Hamilton never delivered the lace. It became part of his personal archive, purchased by the Library of Congress in 1848, and is now available for viewing upon request. And I've done it. You can do it. You can see it, but I'm giving you images. Did Martha ever get Ipswich lace? So oh, I wanted to show you a little more, all right, here we go. The sort of medium brown you're seeing is a cloth that it's supporting what's on top of it, which is a knitted shawl. Uh, we don't, I don't remember whether Martha was the one that actually knitted or not. She was a knitter. And what you can't see yet, I will show it to you shortly, is that the outside edge actually has three different strips of Ipswich lace three different patterns. Come on, wake up. Wake up. I don't know why it doesn't want to go down. Mm. 
Here we go. Uh, Karen and I uh, talked Mount Vernon to bringing out the shawl because it's in a very special, I'm sure, humidity, uh, you know, careful, special drawer. It was a big deal for them to get it out. Um, Karen was actually my ace in the hole to get it to come out because I presented her as an Ipswich lace uh, expert, which she is. And the two of us went down and I photographed the bigger part of the shawl and all of the smaller pieces, uh, which of course I shared with her. But those are the three different patterns that are on that shawl. And I wanted to show you, a, forgive me, a clean piece of Ipswich lace. This is at the Smithsonian. We think it's Ipswich lace. Let's put it that way. Karen, it, it looks like it. That's what Karen and I are calling it. It's a sample. That's a close up. We're going to get closer in just a moment. So you can see how the patterns work together. Oops. This is what I love doing. I love getting in there with my macro lens and really going for the details because I like seeing how something is constructed. No lace has secrets from me. So now we know that Martha wore lace. The question is, did her husband? And the answer is yes, not for everyday duties, but the but at those formal White House receptions when Martha wore lace. To dress quietly but well was a way to demonstrate respect for one's guests. And there's a story. Ay, what a story. <laughs> Francis Morris, associate curator in charge of textiles at the Met, published Notes on Laces of the American Colonists in 1926, almost 100 years ago. In it, she quotes author George Mason, who wrote The Life and Works of Gilbert Stuart. Jane Stuart, daughter of Gilbert, wrote about Washington's lace as follows. And I'm going to just read this. The whole thing is a quote. Quote, many years after the death of my father, Gilbert Stuart, Mr. Benjamin Peel, gave a lecture on the Washington portrait in which he made an attack on the style of dress in which Stuart had represented Washington and denied his ever wearing lace on his bosom or wrists. The next day, my sister Anne wrote him a note to say that we had in our possession some lace which my father cut from Washington linen. The circumstances were these. My father, Gilbert Stewart, asked Mrs. Washington if she could let him have a piece of lace such as the general wore to paint from. She said, certainly, and then inquired if it would make any difference if it were old. He replied, certainly not. I only wish to give the general effect. She then brought the linen with the lace on it and said, keep it. It may be of use for other pictures. Mr. Peel answered my sister's note very politely and said he had never seen Washington in lace ruffles. I, Jane Stewart, have given away this lace an inch at a time until it has disappeared. The largest piece I gave to the lace to the late Mrs. Harrison Gray Otis, possibly a re relative of Mercy, I don't know, who had it framed. There's more to the story. Now, we're all familiar with paintings of Gilbert Stuart. Oops. The skater. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is going back. You're familiar with this. Gilbert Stuart was born here in Rhode Island, went to Europe for training, and bless him, he came back. This is another one. She's got a look. I, I seem to gravitate toward these, okay? And then one of my personal favorites for a variety of reasons is Abigail Adams. And I have actually seen the original and, and it's, it's an amazing piece. 
And a lot of times I bring this picture out because uh, this is someone who was on a farm. She had a very uh, tough life in many ways. This was done um, at, a, I think she was already, already out. I think her husband was not president anymore. I'd have to go back and take, I'd have to go back and look at dates. But she wanted you to know she had made it. You know, she was, and and it wasn't just that she was, you know, you have to stop and think. She wasn't just the wife, the first lady of the second president of this country. She and Martha Washington were friends because while Martha was first lady, Abigail Adams was her right-hand man as the second lady. So they had quite a relationship. And actually, uh, Mercy Otis Warren was also a friend too. And these ladies were a force to be reckoned with, okay? Um, where am I? Okay. But Gilbert Stewart painted George Washington the most often, almost a hundred times in the course of his career as his, poor, as his career as a portrait artist. And he had three formats. Okay. The first one he did was known as, was known as the Vaughn portrait, and it was done in 1795. Keep the date in mind. And he was named for Philadelphia merchant Samuel Vaughn, and it shows the right side of George Washington's face. There is the full length portrait. This is called the Lansdowne Portrait. It was painted in 1796, roughly a year later. It is named for the first Marquis of Lansdowne, who received it as a gift from Philadelphia merchant uh, William Bingham and his wife Anne. This is the version Dolly Madison rescued from the White House when the British were burning down, trying to burn down, well, they did burn down the White House in 1812. And there are a total of four of these long, these full length portraits. Also painted in 1796, um, this is known as the Athenaeum portrait because it was originally owned by the Boston Athenaeum. It is now co-owned, uh, jointly owned by the National Portrait Gallery in Washington and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And I just assumed that they traded back and forth periodically. This particular portrait was painted 75 times. The original, what you're looking at, was never actually finished, nor was it ever given to George Washington as planned. Stewart kept the original to use as a model for copies. And I know you've seen this picture because it's on the $1 bill. And if you're as old as I am, you've seen it on stamps. More to the story. In 2015, I was asked to photograph and identify all of the laces in the Mount Vernon collection. One of the first pieces I shot was this one. It was in such poor shape that then curator Susan Schower, she has moved up the ladder in Mount Vernon, so she's not the curator that I, was, that I deal with anymore, asked me if it was worth keeping. I asked her to delay making a decision. I wanted to study it, and then I would make a recommendation. What I later told her is that the lace it was made in Argentan, France, and it was very rare. I recommended that Mount Vernon keep it, no matter its condition. That first shoot was what I call mug shots. It was quite the operation. I had a table, I had two different tripods set up. One was with my camera to take the big picture. There was a smaller tripod with my phone. We had assistants at Mount Vernon who just kept passing me pieces of lace and we just had a whole assembly line going. But a little over a year later, they asked me to come back and do what I call the beauty shots. That's when I have my fancy lights set up. I'm looking for dimension and other things, some of which you've already seen. Um, on this occasion, our, our Argentan lace had a visitor. A matching piece had traveled from the Dorothy Quincy house outside Boston, and I was delighted 
to photograph all three of these cousins together. I've actually gone to the Dorothy Quincy house and seen it back where it normally is. And I encourage you to go. It is an amazing experience. I felt like I was out of body. Um, in the interim between shoots, Mount Vernon had been very busy going through their files and entering material into their database. And in the process, they discovered additional correspondence from Jane Stewart. She had not cut all of the lace that had been used in the Washington portraits. A piece had been gifted to a Mrs. Fisk in 1858. Mrs. Fisk donated the lace uh, uh, to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in 1885, which is how the lace came back to Mount Vernon. So these pieces of Argentan lace that you're looking at descended from the Stewart family and supposedly was the lace Gilbert Stewart used to paint George Washington. Now, having said that, I was not, as a researcher, going to be happy until I had a little more documentation. Was this really the lace in the portraits? Stewart's portraits of George Washington consistently show Washington wearing lace, but Stewart's approach to portraying the lace was very painterly. A line, a dribble, a dot. Stewart gives the impression of, of lace, of pattern rather than the exact likeness. And he seems to have added occasional details such as peacoat, these little bumpy things along an edge, it'll be in one piece of lace and not in another. It wasn't very consistent. It doesn't help identification of the lace that the more portraits Stuart painted, the more vague the lace depiction. To a lace historian, lace historian, this was a little frustrating. I cannot tell you how many Gilbert Stuart portraits of Washington I have stared at, but I finally, finally found one of reasonable detail. This is at the Huntington Library in California. I'm not leaving you to try to figure it out. That's as close up as I could get of the Jabo with the lace next to it. And if you stare at it long enough, you can see the little fountains of leaves. You can see some of the undulating serpentine lines. I'll give you a moment to stare at that. I'm gonna give you a better shot in a minute. Okay, Gilbert Stewart was not the wasn't the first artist to paint George Washington wearing lace. Swedish immigrant Adolf Wertmuller painted Washington in 1794. This was a year before Gilbert Stewart started painting George Washington. Washington was still a president was still president at the time, and they were all in Philadelphia, which was the capital at that time. They had moved out of New York. They were not yet in the DC area. They were all in Philadelphia for about 10 years. Since Washington sat live for the portrait, it is fair to assume that the lace jabo depicted belonged to the Washingtons. And I'm going to show you that. Wertmuller rendered an exact depiction of the lace making it possible to later match it to the pieces in Martha's lace collection. And here's a very similar view. And you can see the lace pattern very clearly. Since Wertmuller's portrait predates those of Gilbert, it is not unreasonable to guess that once Wertmuller's portrait was completed, he returned the lace borrowed. Martha was then free to give it to Stuart for his portraits. This, is, this lace is the type George Washington might have worn at his formal levies. It would have been sewn 
to the front of his shirt and removed now and then when the linen shirt was laundered for cleaning, for mending, and then reattached or not reattached, but lent to artists for portraits. Mm -hmm. And so this lace traveled from France to America, to the Washingtons, uh, to wherever Martha and George were when she obtained it or they obtained it, to Philadelphia, where it was painted in 1794 and 1796 by two different artists, to Newport, to Mount Vernon, with a few unknown stops along the way. I have recently learned that this lace has undergone conservation. I will be re-photographing it in a few days. But what you are seeing in the Wirtmuller portrait of George Washington is that Argentan lace. In the early 1800s, when lace was fashionable to wear, it became a sign of refinement and respectable, respectability in the home, a signpost of the rising middle class. Excuse me, when lace was less fashionable in the 1800s, I said that incorrectly. It became a sign of refinement in the home. After the Civil War, lace would again take the stage as a fashion accessory. Wealthy American women traveled to Europe to purchase what was now antique lace to be refashioned for modern use. Now, 400 years after its introduction, lace continues to maintain its status as an American material culture icon, symbol of beauty, refinement, and power. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs>